and welcome to Sophie and the Soul Finders. Um, I am delighted to introduce you to a wise elder today. Her name is Judith Hode. She is a carpenter, a calligrapher, a writer, um, a designer, a dressmaker. She's been all of that and more. Um, a journalist um, and she's inspired many including myself over a span of um, 83 years she has lived in Ireland in Donegal uh, with her husband Jeremiah they moved in 1981 and they um, lived a life that was off-grid uh, long before many tried out that kind of living and she inspired me with her book Need or Greed first. I was a journalist for a Source magazine, an ecological magazine at the time, it was in the 90s. And I went up to visit her in Donegal and interview her. And it was such a pleasure to meet her, see where she lived, how she lived. And I stayed overnight, I remember and felt very, very impressed um, by, by her and her husband and their lifestyle, I must say. So I decided to interview her today and because she is in Donegal and we live the times we live in and she has no access really, it's, not, it's quite rather complicated to do a Zoom connection with her. So I decided to do a phone conversation and I recorded it. And so what you will hear now is this uh, phone conversation and I've added some photographs of nature and her and her books um, to the mix. So I invite you to relax, slow down and listen to her storytelling, meandering ways. Uh, as she um, tells, she chats about her life, about her uh, professional and sentimental life, uh, about her travels, about um, the books she's written, about lots of anecdotes and experiences that she's had and the wisdom that she's gleaned for the times we live in. So I invite you to sit back and enjoy. Thank you. So, Judith, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How would you introduce yourself? Well, I would introduce myself as Judith Howard. <laughs> um, I am widowed for the last 21 years. Mm -hmm. I had a very increasingly happy marriage for 38 and a half years to a man who was a landscape painter. Um, I was self-employed from I was 19 years old. Um, I think I'm probably too independent for a lot of people's taste. <laughs> um, it was my independence that I used to get irritated when I was working for other people and I might make a suggestion and I got brushed off. I was probably a cocky little bitch if the truth was told. <laughs> um, and um, so I had um, been making my own clothes from I was 15, that was for four years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, somebody asked me out of the blue about where she could get something mended. And I couldn't think of anything. I said, well, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So um, within the space of a few weeks, I became Judith Canterbury, dressmaker and dress designer. Wow. And what age and were I you? Took, I took myself off to the art school. Uh -huh. um, I got friendly with the woman who was in charge of the fashion department. And she tucked me into her class. And I learned the professional way to make patterns to fit an individual, uh -huh. which was a tremendous thing to have. Because, you know, people would bring pieces of cloth and they'd be the funniest of shapes but they bring a butteric pattern and hope you'd you know you'd fit their 42 inch hips into a 36 you know that kind of a way yes I so um <laughs> so um yeah so i set up on my own uh -huh. i think what age were you yes 
19. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the jobs I undertook, um, because I used to attend the theatre, there was a repertory theatre in Canterbury, which is where I was living. Mm-hmm. And I was living there because that's where my parents were living. Mm-hmm. And I had been in college in Bristol, which is where my father was born. Uh, he's um, part Welsh and part Irish, um, but he was born in Bristol. Mm-hmm. I was born in Bristol, in the Bristol Royal Infirmary, no less, mm-hmm. on the 26th of September 1937. So that makes me 83. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, my parents, um, da- Daddy was two things. He was a trainee probation officer in Western Supermare, which is a, a seaside town in Somerset. Mm-hmm. And he was also a conscientious objector. Mm-hmm. Well, I was born in 37, so there was all sorts of whisperings and moanings and groanings about what Mr. Hitler was up to. And, of course, the war broke out in 1939, when I was two years old. Mm-hmm. By that time, um, Daddy had applied for... Um, because he was a conscientious objector, the senior man that he worked for, the man who was above him in the office, mm-hmm. said, we don't want any bloody conscious around here. You better find a transfer. Mm. So, yeah, friendly. Um, mm-hmm. So Daddy applied to the home office for a transfer, and he was moved to Stoke Newington, which is a, an area in North London. Yes. So he couldn't find anywhere for us to live in that area, although I think briefly I have a memory of a of stairs and, and a flat, but it must have been very brief. Um, he finally found us um, a house, a semi-detached house, on a corner. It was 146 Churchill Road. Mm-hmm. You don't forget that kind of address when Mr. Churchill was a guy in mm-hmm. charge of the country at the time. Absolutely. Oh, um, yeah. And um, mm-hmm. so Daddy rented this house from a man called Mr. Swan. That name just came back to me quickly. That was good. Yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> yeah, and Mr. Swan had all his own belongings in the front room of the house, and so that room was locked. Okay. And we had um, the room behind that, the rooms upstairs, I think there were three bedrooms, a little one and two big ones, and the bathroom. And the kitchen was um, in the back part of the house next door to the dining room. Mm-hmm. And there was what, something called an Anderson shelter in the garden. An Anderson shelter was built of brick, and it had a reinforced concrete roof, which was flat. Mm-hmm. And inside it had two pairs of bunks. And that was all. Mm-hmm. And they were singles, and they were not broad. Now, my wartime memories are as follows. I was waking up one morning in my bunk. Yeah. And I turned my head and there was a white enamel bucket beside my bed. And over the top of it was the ash riddle. Do you know what that is? No. It's a circular um, frame about three or four inches deep with a mesh in the bottom. Mm-hmm. And in those days, you put the ashes from your fire into it, you shook out the dust, and you reused the bits that were left. Okay, they're a little bit like Coke. Okay, yes. Okay? That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So the, the ash riddle had been put over the top of the bucket, mm-hmm. and inside the bucket was a hedgehog. Ah! <laughs> Daddy had seen him in the garden. And he found him and he caught him and he put him in the bucket. Mm. And he introduced me to the hedgehog and he showed me how to pick him up without crippling myself or hurting the hedgehog. Sure. Lovely. Um, Yeah, exactly. That was my dad. And those are my wartime memories. Now, I do remember things like like doodlebugs. I mean, that's what we called the drones. That's what they call them today. But we called them doodlebugs. They were... um, pilotless drones mm-hmm. that came over and it was you know when there's a thunderstorm you see a flash and you start counting until you hear the, 
the thunder and then you know how far away the, the lightning yes. struck. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, we used to do that when mm. the engine stopped mm. on the thing that was going overhead. Sure. And we started counting oh, until we had the bang. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And there was one that fell in the street behind ours and there was a little girl that I had played with that I never saw again. Oh, God. But nobody said to me, oh, little Helen's dead. Nobody said that to me, mm. ever. Mm. And I <laughs> I was late for school one day. I was going to Priory Road Primary School. It was a state primary school. Um, and I was late, and I was running, and a doodlebug was coming across. And I looked over my shoulder to see where it was, and I ran into a lamppost and nearly knocked myself out. I had a huge bruise. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I got to school, right? My first Christmas, I remember, I must have been four. Mm, and, amazing um, memory. Yeah, and my Christmas present was a sheet of red blotting paper and a sheet of green blotting paper, a bottle of red ink and a bottle of green ink and a pen. Wow. Yeah, wasn't that great? Yes, absolutely. And great. then I went to school. We moved um, at the end of the war. We moved into Kent. Mm -hmm. And we lived in a village called Headcorn. It's spelled exactly as it sounds, Headcorn. Mm -hmm. um, it's on the main road from Maidstone to Dover. And Maidstone is a county town of Kent. So uh, initially I went to the primary school um, there. Mm -hmm. And there I had a very interesting experience because I, I'm, uh, I crouch a bit now, I'm round-shouldered, but I, I started life at five foot nine, which is quite tall. And I was five foot nine by the time I was ten years old. No. So, yeah, I was very tall. Okay. So I stood up like a sore thumb. And I was also fairly shy. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it today, would you? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, <laughs> and so there was a boy who was the, the school bully, basically. His name was Eugene Butcher. Okay. Gene Butcher, we called him. And uh, he wasn't as big as me, but he was a pure bully. And I had long braids. My hair was very long, and mm -hmm. it was plaited. Mm -hmm. And he used to pull them. And it hurt so much, he would tug them just quickly. It would jerk my head back, and it was so painful. Mm. And I came home grizzling to my mother one day, oh, Gene Butcher's been pulling my hair, all that kind of rubbish. And my mother said, well, don't come home grizzling to me. Sort him out. Look after yourself. So what do you mean? I mean, my parents were Quakers. They were pacifists, for God's sake. Right. <laughs> I said, give him a good punch. And I thought, oh, all right. Well, of course, being tall, I also had long arms. Mm -hmm. And the next time Jean Butcher came for me, I lost the rag and I beat the shite out of him. And I never had any more trouble. It was yeah. wonderful. <laughs> and I hadn't realized that I had that kind of power. <laughs> we had um, a teacher called Miss Baker who taught us in the second year, third year, whatever year it was. Um, and one day she produced uh, wedge-ended um, pen nibs. And she said, I'm going to teach you. Um, I can't remember what she called it. But it, it was a it was a script which was called by Edward Johnston, who was a famous calligrapher mm -hmm. in the turn of the century in England. Um, he wrote a book showing exactly how to do it, a wonderful book. I still have it. And he said, um, this woman said, um, you're going to learn um, calligraphy. Mm. What? <laughs> Anyway, she handed out the pens and she gave us the ink and she gave us a quick rundown on how we should do it. And I started to do it. And she came by and she said, you've done this before. I said, no, miss, I haven't done it before. Mm -hmm. And many, many, many years later, when I'd sort of been introduced to all sorts of alternative ways of thinking, I thought, yeah, perhaps I was here in a previous life and I was a scribe. Mm. 
mm-hmm. because it came to me just out of the blue. I knew how to do it. Yeah, amazing. And I still do it. I have two friends who work in Oxford Island, which is a nature reserve just south of Belfast, near Lurgan. Okay. And um, Peter is head warden, and Greg is his sidekick. Mm-hmm. And Greg is a nature poet. Mm. So last winter, not this year, but last year, he gave me a hundred of his poems typed, and I um, scribed them onto a certain kind of paper for reproduction, because when you do work for reproduction, um, you work, um, how can I explain it, proportionately um, larger, because when it's reduced photographically, it's much sharper. So I spent the whole winter doing Greg's poetry. Tell us a little bit more about, because that's what you said you were doing last year, and how do you spend your life usually? What is a typical well, my, day my, here? My working life at the moment has mm-hmm. a similar character. Um, I have a friend, um, a key half of the partnership in Enniskillen. He's a market gardener. Mm-hmm. And he commissioned me He gave me a whole lot of old roofing slates and he commissioned me to write the names of all the plants he grows. Um, And then he gave me, um, I had to do north, south, east and west. And I had to put the own characters and another symbol, I forget what it was from, on each one. Mm -hmm. Really interesting work. Because for some of his plants, he's got the, the name in English, mm-hmm. Latin, and also in Gaelic. So I've done the English one in ordinary kind of script. The Latin one I've done in italics. And the Gaelic one I've done in a Gaelic script. So there, it's been interesting to do mm. them that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's been great fun, and I've just come to the end of it, yes. Can you explain a little bit how you came to Ireland in the first place? <laughs> Why? Okay, how did we come to Ireland? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was 24, I'm still living in Canterbury, I had a commission from the theatre, the Marlowe Theatre, mm-hmm. to make the costumes for the pantomime, which was Aladdin. It was a good big job for a, a you know a one horse dressmakers. Absolutely, I actually employed two people uh, for a while. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, so I took it on, and uh, it meant that in case anything went wrong or somebody you know tore something, I had to be in the wings every time the show went on. Well, the pantomime it started in December, it ended in January. You know. Mm-hmm. So I was there, and there was a man who was teaching art at the local comprehensive school. And his name was Jeremiah Philip Edward Hode. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) he was known (laughs) as Jerry. And so Jerry had permission to draw backstage. He was drawing, he was practicing rapid figure drawing. Mm -hmm. So as the characters were waiting to go on, I've got no end of... Um, rear views of people like Sue Jameson, Brian Murphy, who later became quite famous um, in repertory, um, and so on, that Jerry made years and years ago. Um, so I had a friend um, called Sue Lodge, and Sue was the wife of one of the actors who had already got a, a job in London, so he wasn't around, but she was still there, and she had a little boy called Billy. Did she have Billy at the time? No, I don't think she did. Um, anyway, Sue and I um, got together because the council had decided that a theatre was something the town didn't need. Mm. So they were closing it permanently mm. after the end of the of the um, pantomime. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> Sue and I um, decided we, we would give a party for all the people um, 
left in the company. Mm -hmm. And there were four couples. So that was grand. And then at the very last minute, um, what was his name? Adrian Bree. Bree? Brian? Something like that. He decided he wasn't able to come after all, right at the last minute. Sue had a telephone, that was a rarity in those days. Mm -hmm. And because she was theatre people, you know, you couldn't live without one if that was your trade. And um, so he rang to say he couldn't come. Oh, damn, we're cooking for eight people. Oh, that's going to throw out the whole symmetry of the table and all this kind of crack, you know. <laughs> and so she's striding up my kitchen and I'm fussing around with the pheasant that I'm cooking. And um, suddenly she says, I know, Jerry Oud. All right, then. Yeah, okay. So off she went to the theatre where the show was still on. Jerry was in the wings, drawing. And she came back and told me what happened. She tapped him on the shoulder. And he looked up at her and she said, will you come to supper? In a whisper. And he shook his head. And then she said, Judith will be there. And he nodded. <laughs> <laughs> she was tickled to death. She came back and told me that. So, all right, um, they all turned up at about half past ten. And we ate, and we laughed, and we sang, and we drank. Mm -hmm. And about half past one or two o'clock, everybody went home, except Jerry. Mm -hmm. We were still talking at half past six the next morning. Now, this man had a motorbike, a matchless 500. And he lived five miles out of the town in a house that had been the miller's house, and it was beside a windmill that was no longer functioning. And so he got on his motorbike and went home for breakfast. <laughs> and um, well, it has to be said that he was in my house every evening after school, often with a companion called John Jones, for a cup of tea. So I fed them tea, and um, he'd go off home afterwards when John went. And on the 17th of January, now, this is 1962, I met him on the 30th of December, 1961. On the 17th of January, 1962, he asked me to marry him. And I was so blown away, because no one had ever asked me to marry them before. They all just wanted to jump into bed, you know, and I was a bit of a prude. I wasn't having any of it. it was, I wasn't a virgin, but I was not jumping into bed with every Tom, Dick and Harry who thought he'd make a pass, you know. Mm -hmm. When you have a wedding or, or a funeral or anything, you have to have the, the registrar there. We have our own registrars, or we had. I, I was a Quaker in those days, I'm not anymore. But, um, yeah, so as long as we had the registrar there, we married ourselves. And we, it, it, the Quakers are interesting. They don't have a functionary except the registrar. And he's only there to see you sign the right documents and the... There's the standard um, long thing that's printed in, I think, in red, mm -hmm. which everybody signs. Yeah, any wedding, you have one of these. Mm -hmm. But I also have a Quaker um, wedding certificate, which is equally valid, but often not recognized because they're a very small population. They're well known, but there's very few of them. Um, and I have one of those, and it's signed by every single person who was present. And there are 52 signatures on it. Isn't it lovely? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I still have that. And so you I still honeymooned have in, in Ireland, did you? Or Sorry? Did you honeymoon in Ireland? No, no, we didn't. We honeymooned in Wales. Mm -hmm. My my dad, um, as I think I told you, was half Welsh. Yeah. Um, but he'd, he'd grown up in Bristol. Mm -hmm. But he had a great grow for Wales. And he and the solicitor that he was friendly with in Sittingbourne, this is in Kent, they took a seven-year lease on a, a cottage in the middle of nowhere in Carmarthenshire, in the middle of Wales. And it was down at, oh, I don't know how long it was, half, three-quarter mile, rough lane. I mean, it, it was um, unpaved. And there was his house standing in the middle of the field. It was called Baidea, which in Welsh means cow shed. 
<laughs> and it had nothing. It had no electricity. Mm-hmm. It had nothing. Mm-hmm. And um, so we had our honeymoon there, and then we also spent our holidays there for the following seven years. So we took Esther there when she was born. She was our first baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was born, uh, we got married in, in, on April the 14th. 1962, and Esther was born on December the 9th, so she just made it. I think I was probably, I had conceived a couple of weeks before we got married, but so what? I mean, in those days, that was sort of a very hairy thought, but, um, you know, I could always pretend she was a little bit premature. You know? I've got lovely photographs uh, from way back then, mm-hmm. and great memories, because um, for me, going to Wales was like going home. And um, it, for a long time, while we lived here, I talked about Wales as home. Mm-hmm. And I, we'd probably been here about 20 years when I caught myself on one day and I thought, the hell with it, this is home. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm actually an Irish citizen. Mm, right. You know, citizen. I have an Irish passport, okay. Okay. you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I recognize nice now that I am, um, So because um, here in Ireland we have these ridiculous um, reservations on which people speak Gaelic Mm -hmm. that nobody does outside that area, I live in a non-Gaelic speaking area so I've never gone to the trouble of learning to speak Gaelic but had we lived in a Gaelic area I would have done. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are similarities between the languages but they sound totally different. And they they are different in structure. I mean, when you look at Welsh, Mm -hmm. every single letter and diphthong has a sound. You look at at Irish, there's great lumps of it that aren't pronounced. I find that very frustrating. (laughs) It sounds a bit... Welsh, I hear, is quite similar to Breton. Yes, it's uh, actually true. I remember when, when we lived in Wales, that we used to have what we called in Welsh, Shawnee Winnons. That's Johnny Onions. And every winter, Breton boys used to come over to Wales with vast quantities of onions and garlic. And they spent their evenings making skeins of them. So you might have 10 or a dozen onions as a skein that hung one above the other. Um, uh, and, and garlic the same, and they would sling them in pairs across their handlebars and the crossbars of their bicycles and ride out into the countryside and sell these to the farmers' wives. So when the Breton boys came to our door, we understood one another. You know, we had enough in common to be able to understand one another. It was a lovely experience. It really was. Yeah. And to go back. Ireland, what brought you over? Why did you decide to come over? Well, two years before we moved, a woman called Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister of the the UK. Mm. She was class A1 bitch. (laughs) And she was doing all sorts of terrible things socially. Mm. Um, And um, we just decided we'd had enough. And how much further west can you go? Ireland. Decided to go to Donegal straight away, or did you...? No, no, what happened was, um, we were living in Wales, and we were, we were, we'd been there about 13 years, I think, and um, 13 figures a lot in my life, it's a lucky number for me. Mm-hmm. Now, it, this is quite a circuitous story, because we took a magazine, what the hell was it called? It was one of these... Um, sustainability kind of things. Practical self-sufficiency, that's what it was called. It was published in Saffron Walden, which is somewhere in the east of England. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it has another claim to fame. There's a, a Quaker boarding school there. Anyway, um, we took this magazine. It was a bi-monthly. Yeah. And it had an advertisement in it for a thatch that was three miles from the sea. Um, and what was they asking for? I think 
was 1500 or something. Or maybe the, the price wasn't mentioned. I don't know. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But it gave a, tele, a, it gave a, a telephone number. Yeah. And um, so that we had already, it, it was coming up to Easter. It, it was the end of March or the beginning of April. And we had already um, booked a passage for us and our ambulance, which answered as a as a living van, um, to come across to do a recce. It was very popular for English people who had the notion to leave England to go to Kerry. Yeah. And we talked about this. And <laughs> Pembrokeshire is known in Wales as Little England Beyond Wales because it's so full of English people. And we thought, we don't want to go and live in Little England beyond Dunleary. Um, so what do we do? Um, and um, and you had that we, put an, we put an advertisement in, in uh, that magazine, yeah. did we? That's what we did. Mm -hmm. And I had a phone call one Saturday morning. And there's this man, have you write a letter from my wife? And I said, no, which course does she want to do? I don't know about a course, it's about a house. <laughs> and this is a man from Leicester who, with his wife, has lived in the townland here oh. for maybe five or six years. Okay. And um, he has a little girl called Safi, who's the same age as our Missy, who at that time was nine. And um, so <laughs> I said, no, I haven't heard of And he said, about the house. And I said, well, yeah, but we're coming over. Can we come and see it? And so we did this crazy journey mm -hmm. in our ambulance. Yes. And we came up into, um, into Cashel Ogre and eventually found um, Philip and Audrey Townsend and their little girl, Taffy. There's this ancient cottage with a decaying thatch, mm -hmm. and it has a, um, a rough street, they call it up here, it's a yard, in front of the house. And it's on a steep hill, and the land below the house falls away downhill. And there was a, um, there's a ditch, you know mm -hmm. what I mean by a ditch, a okay. raised bank, which is on the far side of the yard from the house. It's about 15 feet from the house. Mm -hmm. And it had a gap in it to go into the field. And Jerry stood in that gap, and he looked across this wide, wide valley with the blue stack mountains to his left. And if he walked far enough down the garden, he could see the ocean to his right, oh. three miles away. Yeah. And he said, this is it. Yeah. And I was looking at the roof and I thought, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> because I saw the third roof in front of me that we had ever done. Right. <laughs> and so it, the thatch had to come off because it was it was dire. Mm -hmm. and that there was a, a chaffinch nesting over the, the door. Mm. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we fed the chaffinch for ages. <laughs> And, uh, you wrote three books in total. I have you? three books published, yes. The first one um, I published myself, I Am Shoestring Publications. Um, it's registered, I, you know, I went, did all the formalities, and it's got an ISBN number and all those things. Um, and it's called This is Donegal Tweed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I was in textiles from a very early age um, in my teens. I've always loved handwork. I, I, was intellectual and I went to a grammar school, but I loved handwork. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned to make baskets when I was eight or nine years old, and things mm -hmm. like that. I love to do things with my hands. Mm -hmm. So I knit and I, I sew and I crochet and I do all the feminine things, but I'm also a carpenter. Um, you know, I've done most of the woodwork in this house, you know, doors, and door frames. Mm -hmm. I didn't make the windows, a friend did. I hadn't got the moldings for the windows. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then and you decided to do Need or Greed. That's why did you... So need, need, need or Greed came about because um, 
Now then, I was traveling on a train. I, w I was smuggling some cloth into the country. On the train, yeah. I got into conversation with a woman. Uh -huh. And um, we chatted away. And I suppose, you know, like everybody else, we both ran away at the mouth. And, and I told her that I'd you know, written this book, published it myself and stuff. And the next thing I know, she is um, Michael Gill's wife. Michael oh. Gill being Gill of Gill and Macmillan. Yes, and yeah. The next thing I know, I get a call from Tessa. What was Tessa's name? She was the commissioning editor for Michael Gill. And um, she's trying to get me to write an autobiography or something. I said, no, 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 I've got a much better idea for you. And uh, I sold her the idea of Needle Greed. I went to meet her in, in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And um, we sat down and I sold her the idea of Needle Greed. Mm -hmm. And um, she also, she said, um, did that come first? It must have done. Yes, it was a result of the journey with Anne. Sure. That that I was given the job of writing um, Healing with Herbs. Oh, okay. Because they had they were doing this series of books, Healing with Aromatherapy, Healing with mm -hmm. you know, bloody well everything. Yeah. And uh, so I did the Healing with Herbs one because I had been using herbs. I was a, a self taught herbalist from I was in my early 20s because I discovered when I was 15 that I was allergic to penicillin. Mm. And I'm now 83 and the allergy is still with me. Mm. And I'm also allergic to antihistamine, which I is an anti-allergic, which they tried on me some years later. And that was horrible. I mean, uh, I only had it the once and it doesn't it hasn't been a, a continuous thing like the penicillin has. But when I had it, it was, it lasted for six weeks and it was a pinhead burning red rash all the way down my spine mm. and across the roof of my head. My mm. head. Oh, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. And it very, very slowly, it wore off. And from that point, I said, right, no more drugs. No more pharmaceutical medicine for me. So I was just beginning to have a family when I was 20, I was 25 when I had Esther. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, you know, my kids could inherit this. And in fact, my son has inherited it. Mm -hmm. And so is his son. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I, um, I decided I'd look at, at this alternative medicine. Well, there wasn't anything in those days. There were no courses. There were no bloody books even. The only book I could get was Sir John Hill, and that was published in 1841 or something. Yeah. Don't tell you anything about how to make a tincture or, or, you know, what the dosage was or anything like that. Just mm -hmm. told you what the plants did and identified them for you. Mm -hmm. So I bought that at vast expense in an antique bookshop mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in Canterbury. Um, but gradually, um, what I did when we moved to Wales was um, I, I went around visiting all the elderly people I could find. Um, because I had both languages, I was able to quiz them about um, what they had used for themselves and their animals before the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started to collect my knowledge about plants. Mm -hmm. And then I just increased it. And of course, time has gone by and there are not only Healing with Herbs written by Judith Hode, but there are lots of other books now, very good books mm -hmm. about um, all sorts of alternative medicine, homeopathy, um, herbal medicine, yeah. um, acupressure, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. I went and did a, a two-year course in England in um, acupressure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerry was wonderful. He's really great because I was gone for the for the um, the uh, academic terms, you know, for two years, mm -hmm. and he was absolutely terrific. He was so supportive. I I couldn't have had better support than him. Mm. He was mm. wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, you said once in that documentary, 
uh, that Ben Fogel did, that you had two major love affairs in your life, that yeah. one with Mother Earth and the other yeah. one with Jeremiah. Jeremiah That's Hope. correct. So yeah. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about particularly your love affair with Mother Earth? Where, why or how did you, did you live that? How is it now? Well, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to think of the time when I didn't think like that. Mm. Um, I just have this sense that all these wonderful things that grow out of the out of the earth, you know, the the seeds that seed themselves, the trees, the bushes, the wayside plants, um, you know, before councils trashed everything mm. like they do now. Mm. We had wayside plants um, and, and spring flowers growing on the roadside. Mm. I mean, I think it's criminal what they do yeah. to the bushes. I really do. Mm. Um, because they tear at them and they destroy them and they, they cause them to get diseased because of the way they cut them. They don't cut them by hand and do the job properly. They use a trasher and it's called a trasher. Mm -hmm. and it trashes them and it tears and wounds the, the bushes. It makes me very angry. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, yeah I, I just have this sense that this planet, that the human race on the planet is actually the planet's parasite. Because mm -hmm. we do such incredible damage. And we have gone on doing damage, and we're still doing damage. This planet nurtures the creatures that live on it. Sure. Um, you know that the, the the plants grow, and in amongst the, the plants there are insects and reptiles mm -hmm. and little animals. I was driving down to the town today, and I was halfway between my lane and the main road. So this is a two-lane road that I'm driving on, mm -hmm. but it's a B road, if you like, and I'm heading for the coast road. Sure. And across my path, I wasn't going fast, praise be to God, a red squirrel ran. You have how many grandchildren and great-grandchildren? Oh, now then, I've got three children, mm -hmm. Esther, Titus, and Martha, who's known as Miffy. Um, and then I have nine grandchildren, uh -huh. um, Naomi and Chloe and Lewis are Esther's, uh -huh. um, Tito has Katie and Gary, and Missy has Becky and Dylan and Ruth and Matthew. Uh -huh. And then you have um, great grandchildren. Yeah, I do have, at the last count, I had um, Naomi, who is my oldest granddaughter, has a son called mm -hmm. Oshin. Chloe, who's her sister, her younger sister, has a boy called Leo. And Leo and Oshin are about three months apart, and nine. Mm -hmm. um, Naomi lives in Cork. And Chloe, who is a very brilliant um, ceramicist, she makes, she uses porcelain to make domestic ware. Mm. She had a feature, I'm looking at it now, in the Irish Times a while back. And there's a lovely photograph in the top left-hand corner of um, one, two, three, four, five. That's six rows of her mugs from above. And they've all got coloured porcelain linings mm -hmm. <laughs> and gas. And how, um, I remember you were saying, we were talking a little bit to prepare for this uh, interview, and you mentioned at one point that you thought that the word hope was very important, and that yeah. um, you felt that it was, what would you say to your great-grandchildren with regards to that word, hope? Um, hope is, I think, the emotion that keeps us going. Um, but hope is something that we can create. Um, that's hard to explain. 
um, if you hope for something strongly enough, you can make it happen. Um, for example, you can buy a house uh, and it doesn't have a garden. And you, oh gosh, I hope I can get a garden. And you work at it and you talk to people and suddenly you discover that there's allotments down the road. And you've got a garden. You know, that kind of thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think by hoping you can, you can actually make things happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, enough people hoped that Donald Trump would fall on his face, and he did. Yes, yeah, it's like a you know, and, and that was very, very important because that man is dangerous, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and um, he, he's dangerous for two reasons. One is that he's totally selfish, and the other is that he has absolutely no comprehension of what's going on in the world. He's ignorant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, how and thank God the man who's taken his place is a bit different. It seems to be. It seems to be. We'll see what happens, I, I guess. Yeah. And I, I was listening to Kamala Harris on the radio today. Oh, yes. And she sounds brilliant. She does. Yeah. Yeah, she really does. Yeah. So you have hope at the moment? I have hope because the right thing has happened. You know, that man is out of the way. With any luck, he's he's going to get charged with the nasty things he's been doing. Okay. But I, I'm less interested in, in the punishment for him as I, than I am in the the positive things that are going to be done now that we have two people with their heads on their shoulders and their hearts in the right place yeah. um, in, in authority. And it's important to the rest of the world because America has such amazing power Absolutely. politically. And, um, and what would you say to Joe Biden if you were having a private audience with him? <laughs> what advice would you give I would him? say to him, thank you so much for laying your old age on the line and taking this job. Mm. Because he's in that for four years and he's not young. No. He's in his late 70s. That's right. And, and um, uh, what I think is brilliant that not alone has he taken a woman as his sidekick, but she is, you know, his vice president, I should say. Yeah. Um, but also she's a woman of color, and I think that's brilliant. Mm. Because I, I think this whole thing about color is just so horrible yeah. and so unjustified. Mm -hmm. I, I tell you a story. Oh, this is nearly 20 years ago now. And I was in Donegal Town, and I was heading for the post office. It was in Tyrconnell Street in those days. It was a custom-built building for the post office. And uh, I was heading down, and walking towards me was this very tall, very black, very sad-looking woman. I'd never seen her before. And I remembered what had happened to us when we first came in 1981. It happened half a dozen times. Complete strangers, either in Duncan Ely or Donegal Town, came up to us with their hands extended, saying, welcome to this land. Wow. Amazing. Yes. It was an amazing feeling to be welcomed like that. It was an amazing thing to happen. Amazing. So I saw that, and that flashed through my mind, and I walked straight up to her with a big grin on my face and my hand out and said, welcome to this land. And she started to laugh, and I thought, oh, God, what have I done now? And she said, I've lived here for three years. I said, well, I've never seen you before. <laughs> <laughs> and her name is Vivian McIntyre. She's from Cuba. Yeah. And her husband is... Um, the Donny Gore man, mm -hmm. Seamus mm -hmm. McIntyre. Yeah. Um, and she has two delightful children, Leah, who is now, must be about 20, and Daniel must be 14 or so, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, they live on, on a housing estate on the edge of the town. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so I got to know mm -hmm. um, Vivian, and every two years she would take her children. She, she worked very hard and she saved the money, and she would take the children to Cuba to spend the summer holidays with her family so that they, they grew up knowing two cultures uh, and who their relations were and all the rest of it. And I can't remember now exactly when it was, four or five or six years ago or maybe more recently, she invited me to join them. Mm -hmm. And so that year I had, I think I had a month in Bolivia and I had two weeks in Cuba with her. 
mm-hmm. and her family. And it was extremely interesting mm-hmm. because there they were with this incredible um, man who had created um, a communist independent state. Mm-hmm. And yet the people were all born again Christians. <laughs> It was unbelievable. And, you know, she took me to meet her friends and um, they were having these prayer meetings. What are you doing in Bolivia as well? What was I doing in Bolivia? Now then, Bolivia. How did I get to Bolivia? Um, I know a girl called... Oh dear, what's her name? She lives in Mayo anyway. At least her home is in Mayo. Um, It'll come back to me, but she, she... Oh. Karul Mithinasi, Carol Finnessy, Karul Mithinasi, she uses the Irish version of her name. Mm. And she telephoned me one day. I didn't know her from mm-hmm. a crow. No, she telephoned me from Mayo. Mm-hmm. And she asked me, would I go to Griffith College because they were having a conference about um, liquid assets, um, and it was they, they were hosting a contingent from Bolivia, and um, she would do the translating. So I said, "Well, what do you want me to talk about?" She said, "Well, well um, it's liquid assets we're talking about." I said, "Well, I don't know anything about oil." I said, but I do know a lot about water. Right, she said, you come and you talk about water. (laughs) So I didn't have any choice. I had to go talk about water. So I did. I do know a lot about water, you know, Mm. and the dowser and all these things. And, um, you know, I I make um, um, flower essences and all that kind of stuff. All this um, vibrational medicine that a lot of people poo-poo. It's like homeopathy, you know, they say, I can't work. Mm. In fact, it does. (laughs) Yeah. You know, uh, and it's provable that it does. Um, it's a similar sort of thing because it, the um, the quality of the remedy is increased. The potency is increased by dilution. Mm-hmm. It, it's a paradox. Anyway, um, where was I going with that? Um, mm-hmm. So I was asked. I was asked, mm-hmm. would I go and um, talk at a conference? Yeah, so, so I, I went to this conference and then I got talking to, through Karul, because she was the interpreter, um, to um, Tanya Quirov. And Tanya Quirov lives in La Paz, which mm-hmm. is the capital of Bolivia, and it's 14. The city has the, the main street is so steep, it's 12 thousand feet at one end and 14,000 feet at the other. And 14,000 feet is where the airfield is and it's the highest airfield in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, the air there is thin. And it it was horrendous. I I saw um, Quechua boys, lads, you know, 8, 9, 10, running uphill in conditions where I could hardly walk 10 paces without I had to stop <sighs> heaving because I couldn't get enough oxygen. Sure. It was an astonishing experience. And I spent the first two days flat on my back because I had to acclimatize. Yeah. And, um, and you did. You, you well, I did, yes. And it was through um, Tanya that I met um, Vivian Camacho who was a doctor. She was training at the time. And um, she asked me would I come to Cochabamba, which is where she lived, which is 8,000 feet above sea level and not quite so desperate as the past is. Um, And uh, I've actually done the bus journey from Cochabamba to La Paz. It takes 10 hours. And all the time you're going along this side of a steep mountain to turn a bend and go along the other side of a steep mountain. I've got photographs I took from the bus of another bus going parallel to us, but like a mile away (laughs) over these canyons. Oh, it's the most incredible terrain. Mm. 
Mm. And you pass little herds of, of goats and little herds of, um, of alpaca and little herds of sheep and all sorts of stuff. Um, it's just an amazing country. What would you say inspired you the most in your life? What, who, oh, who and what? What, what inspires me? Um, it's hard to say. What keeps you going? Um, I think probably creativity is what keeps me going. Mm. I retired from working two years ago. I was teaching natural medicine. And twice when I was doing field work, I pointed at a plant and my memory was blank. And I thought, oh, Jesus, this is the beginning of Alzheimer's, you know. Um, I can't teach when I can't identify plants. So I gave it up, um, which um, really hurt and I missed it a lot. Mm. But um, things have a habit of, of crossing one's path. Um, you know, so I have to. I have to have something to occupy my hands. Yeah, and you were um, saying you're, you're writing as well. Apart from I'm you. writing. Yes, yeah. I'm writing a memoir for my um, for my five great grands. Oh, wonderful! Um, because my childhood was so different from theirs. So I started off with what I remember being told about the things that happened uh -huh. that brought about my childhood. And then the things from when I can remember, I've written about what I can remember. And I, I haven't done anything in it for a while, but I think I've got up to my mid-30s. I've met Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, I've got married. I've started having children. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to go back to it and do it. You know, I, I, um, you can only do so much at a time. I have to stop thinking about it, you know. And then I, it takes me back to that time. And it's a kind of, um, what should I say? It's like it's like evolving backwards, um, going mm. back into that mm. mentality and, and remembering the places and the people and the neighbours. And so you had an but, amazing, uh, um, an amazing life, would you say? How would you? Oh, I've life? had a wonderful life. I I, I had a, an unhappy childhood. Um, I when I was a loner. I went off and did things on my own. I was a, an innovator. Um, I made work for myself, you know, because I, I hated working for other people. Because if I showed initiative, I was a cocky little bitch. I think that's the truth. Um, that. You know, if I showed initiative, I get splatted. So um, I started my, my dressmaking business, and you know, I worked at the theatre, and that's where I met Jerry. And, you know, I, I've worked with my hands. Um, and I suppose I'm a mixture. I went to a grammar school because I, I had I was intellectual, if you like. I passed the eleven plus or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. In India as well, Jerry. I've been in India. Yes, been yeah. more than once. Yeah, mm -hmm. I went with Jerry mm -hmm. on one visit, um, and I've been twice, I think, since on my own since Jerry died. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. To different parts or the same parts? Yes, I went to Alape which is on the coast, on the very southwest of uh, the tip of India, um, Alape. It's mm -hmm. a seaside town. Mm -hmm. And I went there because I have a friend called Bibi Baskin. Oh. And Bibi, I, I knew her from when she, she still lived in Agra with her mother. And um, I knew her mother. And then... Um, Bibi went to India, I think, on holiday, and she fell in love with the place, and she stayed. And somehow or other, we were in touch with one another. I can't remember how. And uh, I went... Uh, oh, she was running a, a place um, in Alipay that she was advertising over here for Irish people to go and spend their honeymoon. So she had a honeymoon hotel, and I think she could take something like four of five or six couples mm -hmm. and um, she put she put me up for a week while I found somewhere for myself mm -hmm. and I found somewhere for myself and I found Alipay so enervating because it was hot and it was steamy mm -hmm. and it was unbearable mm -hmm. so I got to know an Indian woman through uh, her name was Mary Thomas she was a Christian and they all take um they take uh, um, Latin names when they do that. And uh, she knew
knew of a place called Muna up in the up in the Nil- Nilgiri Hills. And I took the bus, how long did it take? Something like five hours. I had to go to uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, the Calibre. No, that's not it. Something else. I had to go to to a big bus station and then I had to take a local bus to get to Muna. And Muna was like thousands of feet up. And it was tea growing country. So it was all tea gardens. Mm. And I stayed with a delightful Indian couple who had lived and worked in Dubai for nearly 20 years. He was an accountant and she was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And they had decided that their children were, they had a son and a daughter and they they were approaching um, secondary school age and they ought to finish their education in India, not in Dubai. So they'd come home and they opened what's called in India a homestay. And homestay is a bed and breakfast. And uh, they they had, I think they could take, I can't remember now how many couples, and they took me as a single. And they were absolutely delightful. And they had a, a, a young friend who had a, a jeep. And they organized trips out into the, oh, the backwards, really. Um, it was a metal road, but we saw elephants and we saw monkeys and we saw alligators. Oh, it was an amazing, amazing journey. Mm. And we saw, um, not alone did we see mm-hmm. um, elephants, and, and we had to keep the engine running because if the if the auntie elephant, because there were baby elephants, mm. was aware of us, she would charge. And she became aware of us, and your man had to put the hammer down and drive away. <laughs> but we, we drove away, and, and it was getting towards the end of the day, so it was almost dusk. And a man on a motorbike going the opposite direction flagged us down. Mm-hmm. And he said, there's an elephant on the road ahead of you. It's a bull elephant. I thought, oh, gee, back. So your man sets off, you know, in very low gear, going very slowly. Mm. And we come to a place where there's a um, a double bend in the road, very very sharp bend to the left, but facing us on a, a farm road, not on the tar, but standing at the end of the farm road, is this huge bull elephant, mm. waving his ears, which is a sign of anger. <laughs> and this, I've never seen. Oh, this young fellow who was driving, he went so pale, and he went round the corner. And down the road. And, and we were out of sight of the elephant, and then we all started to breathe again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, is there anything yeah. is there anything in your life that you would have liked to do that you still want to do that you would like to do but you haven't done? Oh, that's a question. That's something I haven't done. Um, Mm-hmm. I'd love to travel more. I, I'd love to go to the Antipodes. I've never been to Australia or New Zealand, and I've got friends in both. Mm-hmm. Um, have you been? You to know, Africa? people who've been here. Pardon? Have you been to Africa? Oh yes. Oh. Uh, we spent seven seven winters, seven consecutive winters in Tunisia. That's North Africa. Yes, it is. We did that because. Um, well, you know what it's like here in the winter time. It's wet yeah. and it's cold. And Jerry had um, he had a heart condition which was engendered from he had double pneumonia when he was eighteen months old, mm-hmm. and then he got rheumatic fever when he was fifteen. So his heart was affected by the rheumatic fever. Um, so he rode a bicycle for a while, but he couldn't push it uphill. You know, he, he had a hard time. So. Um, so when it came to having um, a holiday, he also didn't perspire properly. Mm-hmm. So he couldn't go to a hot place. Mm-hmm. You know, he'd got this strange skin that didn't perspire. Um, he had psoriasis, which is possibly linked. I don't really know enough about it, but it may be. Um, so we wanted to go somewhere that was warm enough. And, and Egypt, they were busy shooting tourists at Luxor, you know, there've been all sorts of ups and downs there. The Algerians were um, a bit peculiar. 
the Libyans were even stranger. But there was this funny little um, country with, with it was like a figure of eight with a narrow bit in the middle, which is actually called the shot. We didn't know that. It, it's a, um, a kind of a bog. Um, and uh, so we went to Tunis. We flew out to Tunisia. Carthage, you land in Carthage, imagine Carthage. Think back to your Shakespeare, you know. Mm. And um, mm-hmm. we, we travelled to Tunis. We stayed in a, a hotel, just Hotel Salambo. It was just off the main street, which was um, Habib Bourguiba. Habib Bourguiba was the very first president of independent Tunisia. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I was a girl, um, a teenager, Mm-hmm. hearing about this man who was taking over from the French because it was a French colony. Mm-hmm. And the French, um, they speak French and Arabic. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we went out and we stayed in Hotel Salambo for two weeks. Um, but we explored as well. But we made friends with, with Arab people because that's just the way we are, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas there, there were hotel, there was a hotel area, but it was where the Europeans went. We never went near it. What do you make of the whole? What's what we're going through at the moment with the COVID crisis? What's well, I have a question. What's really happening? Yeah. What's really going on? Mm, very good. Yeah. What is? That's my question. Yeah. And do you have an answer? <laughs> no, I don't. I'm mystified. Yeah. But I'm convinced there's something going on, mm. and um, I don't like it. And the other thing that I'm very, um, I find very difficult to handle is the rise of fascism in the world. Sure. So um, I think you know the, the world is changing, and some of it's changing for the better, and some of it isn't. But that's the way life is, isn't it? But what strikes me at the moment is that we have this major event which is climate change Mm -hmm. and that's something we can't alter but we have to adapt to and that is very important Mm -hmm. what would be your advice on that what how would we adapt well i think people have to learn to live more simply um i think to live more locally as well and it's interesting with this um, this disease, which is rampant, or so they say, COVID-19, that um, people are having to remain local. Um, and it's like um, a rehearsal. That's how it strikes me anyway. Mm-hmm. It strikes me as it's, it's a rehearsal for what we're going to have to do mm-hmm. anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we're using up. Um, solid fuel. I mean, I, I'm sitting beside a range which I've got turf briquettes in. You know, I'd, I'd have to make major alterations to my house um, in order to continue to live here in a justifiable way. And I'm 83, and I have a good chance, I think, of living another 10 or 15 years because my family go in for longevity and I'm healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I've got a few structural problems, but I have nothing, you know, I don't get infections readily or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, do you, you still know, I, climb I, up those stairs, that ladder, do you still climb up and down to go to bed? Do, do what? Do you still climb up and down the ladder to go to oh, your yes. bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. It's seven steps. It's okay. <laughs> That's excellent. Yes, and the cats run up behind me and settle down on the coverlet, yes. <laughs> and you're happy? I think so. When I look <laughs> back, I've been, I've been absolutely blessed. Mm-hmm. I've had bad things happen in my life. I've met bad people from time to time. But I've, I've had a charmed life in the sense that I met a man who absolutely adored me. And I'm not being funny when I say that. Mm. He... he almost literally fell in love with me. And I took a long time. I mean, I married him because I was so so touched that somebody loved me and I didn't think I was lovable. Mm. I, I had a very low opinion of myself when I was young. Mm-hmm. 
And it was Jerry who taught me my worth. Mm, beautiful. And, um, and I'm not being immodest about that. Mm -hmm. I have skills, you have skills, he had skills. Mm -hmm. And some of his skills, um, I couldn't attempt. I mean, I couldn't paint the way he painted, his landscape painted. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't, he couldn't manage calligraphy either. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we were in Wales, we had to earn a living and we had a range of black and white postcards that were his drawings and my calligraphy because mm -hmm. I wrote the titles underneath and they were the first and as far as I know the only bilingual postcards in Wales mm -hmm. because um, they, they, they had um, bilingual titles on them mm -hmm. and we had over a hundred designs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some of them were, were things like um, My Hen Lad and Had I which is the um, national anthem and Callon Lan Mm -hmm. which is one of the hymns that the, the rugby players sing. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Do you miss Wales? You speak a lot about it. I did for a long time, yeah. and I am half Welsh, and I, I miss the language. Yeah. Um, but I have two very close friends. <clears throat> he's, he's, a, um, he's retired now, Erwin, but he was director of uh, Welsh Studies for Carmarthenshire County Council. Education Authority for years, <clears throat> and Joyce, his wife, is from Hereford, mm -hmm. and I'm sure she understands every word, but she doesn't speak the language herself. And that they have between them got four boys in it, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, now they've got grandchildren as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I ring up, and if Erwin answers the phone, we have a Welsh conversation, and if Joyce answers, we have an English one. Oh, so I, 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 st I occasionally I forget a word, mm -hmm. and um, because it's the only chance, and I only speak to them maybe two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, but and we're still is, in touch. How is your relationship to Ireland? How has it been? How do you like it? I love it. Mm. It's home. Yeah. Yeah. It's home. Yeah. And you yeah. still, you still off grid, or do you have? No, I do have the mains now. Um, I, <laughs> I was, I, let me see, daddy died and left some money and I had a, a windmill and five PV panels, mm -hmm. photovoltaic panels, we called them solar panels in those days, but that has another meaning now. And uh, uh, when daddy died, I, I had been living with candles and lamps for years and years and um, I thought, I, I don't really like the smell of kerosene. Mm. And I thought it would be great to have electricity. So I had this windmill installed. There was a man down the country in um, North Mayo somewhere. I bought it from. Um, and he came and, and set it up. And I can't remember where I got the, the TV panels from. Mm -hmm. But I had five of them. Uh, so the, the, there was a one kilowatt windmill. It could generate a kilowatt. And there were um, two kilowatts off each of the five panels. So that was two kilowatts, um, 200 kilowatts, two, I don't know. Anyway, um, and I had eight 12 volt car batteries to store it in. So if all was going well, and it, I mean, I'm three miles from the ocean, 650 feet above sea level. You know, there's always a breeze up here, uh, sooner or later. And so long as it, it blew or it shone every three days, mm. I had electricity, and it never failed me. Um, and then, <coughs> pardon me, I belonged to a writer's group. I belonged to two, actually, but one of them, um, a fellow member, was um, a planner, worked in the planning office. And somehow or other, one day, the fact that I made my own electricity arose. <laughs> and he took me aside after the, club, the group was over and we were out on the street again. And he said, um, there's a 100% grant for having the mains installed. Mm. And I thought, oh, why not? Mm. So I went for it. So now there are, there are poles up through the fields. Um, and there's, you know, a meter 
the end of the house that they expect me to read, and I haven't got a clue how to do it. Um, and and I, you see, people have electric cookers, they have fridges, they have all sorts of stuff. I have, in the house, I have one, two, three, four, I have five electric lights, three of which are likely to be on. Um, they're all on at the moment, one in the kitchen, one in the lower room, and the one beside me here. And then I have another one in the back room where I have my toilet. I have another one in the larder because I have a walk-in larder, mm -hmm. if you know what that is. I do. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, and I've got the larder door at the mo open at the moment because I discovered mouse turds and then I saw the mouse. Oh. So I've got a, got a cat on sentry duty in there. Of course, yes, yes. Um, and I'm hoping she catches the little bleeder. But of course, he's up on, on a shelf and she's down on the floor. Yeah. So, uh, anyway. so you were saying you will have five lights and then do you have a fridge? Do you have that kind of thing? Do I have what? A fridge and things like that for your oh, there's, a, there's a fridge in, in the studio, which is my um, um, guest, guest accommodation. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't got one up here because I've got the larder. I don't need it. Of course. Okay. The larder's very cold. Yeah. Um, do you still you know, grow have... your vegetables, Judy? Pardon? Do you still grow vegetables on the land? Some, yes. Mm. I, I've got some um, Jerusalem artichokes, which is not everybody's choice, but I love them um, growing in the garden. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a, a greenhouse that grows um, perennial herbs. It's a, a polytunnel. Yeah. It's 16 by 10. It's quite big and it's self-watering. Mm -hmm. Now, that's that's an interesting thing. We could talk for half an hour about that, but we're not going to. Um, <laughs> yes, I've taken a lot to, of your time. If you want, ever want to learn about a self-watering um, self greenhouse, you just get in touch and I'll tell you how it's done. Mm -hmm. um, what else did you ask? That's, I think... You told me so. You've told me so much already, Judith. Thank you so much for your time. I've, I've taken a lot of your time, so um, I'll let you be and have your dinner. And um, yeah, and wish you very good, very good evening. Good. Well, I hope it's useful to you.